here. My name is Anthony. I've been a coordinator with the club for a little bit over a year now. I primarily do the discussions previously called intelligence portion of the AI club. And as we were kind of discussing earlier, I've done some research into AI and narrative generation here at UCF. So, and um, as to why I like Docker or why I know so much about Docker, actually, I don't know that much. That's flaunting. <laughs> But uh, Docker is a really cool service for deploying code as we're going to jump right into it. So here's the agenda. Why deploying code is hard and oftentimes not fun. What are virtual machines? So before we introduce Docker, we're going to talk about the predecessor for Docker, essentially. Uh, how does Docker fix the shortcomings of virtual machines and how does it help us? Um, we're going to work through some examples. We'll live code a quick Docker file example and I'll also uh, show a little quick API of Docker working. Hopefully it works. I haven't tested it, so we're going to cowboy code that today here. Um, I'll also briefly cover Docker and machine learning and how you can use it for machine learning. Actually, this Saturday at 1 o'clock, John, one of the previous presidents of the club, is going to be covering ML Ops, and he'll be going through a more in-depth example of Docker and machine learning. So this kind of serves as a, pre as a pre prerequisite for that workshop. We'll then cover Kubernetes and WebAssembly um, and how that relates to Docker and cloud native computing, which is the big term that's associated around all this, and things you could do next after you've learned Docker. So we're going to jump right into it. So um, even if you're new to programming, even if you're, you're a few classes in, I'm going to assume everyone here at least knows what code looks like, um, even if they just take an intro to C. So there's going to be a point where you want your code to run somewhere else, where you don't want to run it on the command line anymore, where you want to either write an API, you want that API to not live on your computer. It doesn't make sense to run your website only from your computer. If your computer's turned off, who's going to be able to get to your website? So the thing you want to do is deploy your code to a server. So previously, the solution, one of the more scalable solutions for deploying your code to the server was the server would contain some hardware, that hardware would either, either be a specialized OS or it would be a copy of the OS you were developing on and you just write a script to make the instructions for installing that. There's a lot of shortcomings with this. First of all, the more naive solution is you're deploying code onto the entire hardware itself. So it's essentially if you had a bunch of laptops like the one you're probably watching this workshop on and you just used it for one single program. It's not a really efficient use of resources. So to kind of combat this um, and also combat the increased complexity of deploying code, virtual machines were one of the first solutions for deploying code. Um, this is not in a completely accurate history, but this is follow along with this here. Um, virtual machines, what they do is they simulate an entire computer. So if I'm on Windows and I want to emulate a Mac, Mac has really different hardware instruction. They require specialized chipsets. That's why you don't see Dell making computers with Mac OS on them. Um, only Apple produces Mac computers. So if I wanted to have a Mac running code, I would need to virtualize the entire Mac down to the hardware level. So as the cons kind of, kind of easily list here, if you're virtualizing the entire machine, it's going to be really resource intensive. Not only is it resource intensive, it's really fragile to break in. So let's say if you updated a single part of the operating system and your code was relying on some obscure library, that might break your entire deployment. So these are some of the cons, but there's a pro to this. So virtual machines were used for a reason. They, um, you could have multiple virtual machines running on a piece of infrastructure, as the diagram nicely shows here. They're also easier way to configure, to control the system configuration. So you can give instructions on how you want your virtual machine to look like. You tell wherever you're hosting the server, either it's that the server is in your garage or the server is at Amazon's headquarters, and you just configure it to the way you like it. But um, before I kind of move forward, what for people who don't know Docker, if I just told you about virtual machines, I've told you all these cons, you can either write it in chat or you can say it out loud. What are some of the things you think Docker is going to fix? So hopefully this is an easy one for you for the cons right here, but go ahead and chime in. Reduce resource usage. That's right, that's one of them for sure. Probably won't have to simulate an entire computer, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. You'll be able to easily uh, push updates to the service. 
That's oh, that's that's a really good one. Whoever mentioned that one, I, mean, that, I didn't even list that in the slides. Without actually, you know getting rid of any of the data in it either. Yeah, that is, that is a good benefit of Docker is easily pushing updates. So we're gonna so you see all these shortcomings of virtual machines. They're really awesome, but they are not the best. How can we do better? So someone really smart, well, a bunch of really smart people came up with Docker. Um, what Docker essentially is a very slim virtual machine. If I can quickly show, I don't have my webcam on actually. So I'm gonna turn on my webcam real quick. So sorry for the terrible lighting. So if we wanna compare this big bulky book, Effective Python, this is a virtual machine and then Docker would be this nice slimmed down version. There's a lot less resources available, like being used in Docker and essentially Docker more specifically containers, the things that run your code, only contains the things you need to run it. As the slide says, I'm repeating what the slide. Um, and you might be wondering, that's cool, but how do I create these containers? Um, the way you create container is with a Docker file. A Docker file is just a set of instructions that specify how a container is made. So that's a lot thrown at you right away. Before I move forward, does anyone have any questions? Because I can understand why that might seem confusing if you haven't seen anything yet. So this really is just a minimalist way of running a piece of software. That's that's a really good way of putting it. I do, there is a little asterisk here. Um, Docker uses what's called operating system level virtualization. Uh, really fascinating topic. Topic if you want to read more up a lot of it. I can't speak. If you want to read more up on it really fascinating topic. It essentially is not emulating the hardware, but it's using your own operating system to virtualize the needed parts. And there's something, the Docker engine acts as that interface. So it's a little more advanced for this workshop, but definitely if you like low level computing, something worth looking into. So if there's no other questions, I'm gonna go ahead and move forward. And we're gonna be live coding, like I said, so if things seem confusing, I totally understand if it's just these abstract diagrams. But as you can see here, we're gonna go ahead and compare the two. So with Docker, there's another benefit of Docker is that you're not simulating the entire operating system either, like the entire user space as it's called. Instead, you're using your own operating system to act as that layer. So virtual machine, Docker, uh, this is from the Docker website. So hopefully this diagram can kind of get across the less resource usage of Docker, and that's the big attractive part about it, is it's less resources, which means it's quicker to push out fixes, which means it's quicker to get deployed, less megabytes you're deploying, and there's more Docker containers can run on a single machine because it's less resource intensive, which is really nice for cloud providers like Azure, Google, Amazon, and others. So this is a quick rapid fire round of Docker words and like the, some of the lingo you're gonna see around Docker. Um, the most important thing I want you to take here is a Docker file. So a Docker file is the instructions you use to create your image. And image, no bearing or relation to what we normally call an image or a photo, but your Docker file creates the image and then your a container runs the image. Seems a little confusing, I totally get it. Um, oftentimes people just say container, they skip the image lingo entirely, but in case you see that these terms can kind of be used interchangeably. Um, some other things, really cool things about Docker is just like you have GitHub for pushing and pulling code. So if you want to control your code, you can push to GitHub, you can pull your code from GitHub. I'm assuming some people have familiarity with it. If you don't know what GitHub is, go ahead and write in the chat so I can give a better analogy than just using GitHub. But Docker has what's known as a container registry. So as someone alluded to earlier, you can quickly push out updates. You can have a script that whenever you make a change to your site, it pull, whenever you push to a new Docker image to your registry, it pulls the changes from the site. That's a lot of lingo at once. So I totally understand still if people, if people are getting lost in all the lingo. It's gonna make a lot more sense when we start working through examples. But before uh, I move forward, really quick? Yeah, what's your question? Um, so, I, so I was just wondering, so I know that they use like existing VMs or uh, from what I understand, they use existing VMs in Docker and the containers. But what about for companies that have um, 
or pieces of software specific to them, something that's not open source. Like I know uh, there was a gaming company that uses a uh, their own system to code their games, and mm -hmm. that's something that nobody else uses. So how would Docker work with that, if at all? Um, that's that's a good question. So Docker, the way Docker emulates, like virtualizes um, software and operating systems, um, it doesn't it doesn't use any like VM code. So like someone like VMware by Oracle, um, it's not using any of that. But if you're asking for proprietary software, um, if this company is using like, if they have their own executable program that's proprietary, they can move it over to the Docker container themselves if they wanted to. Let's say this software runs on Linux, Docker has containers for Linux. So they just need to write the Docker file to create the instructions to run that if that answers the question or that makes sense. It would kind of be up to the company's responsibility to make that container. Um, oh, I mean, I don't know if that if it extends to game engines because I just remembered it was uh, Bethesda. Uh -huh. And I think they, I'm pretty sure they use their own game engine. So I don't know if that extends over to that realm. Yeah, but... so you technically, yeah, you wouldn't use um, game engines with Docker. That's not really an application of it. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, that's, so things like mobile apps, like we were talking about earlier, you wouldn't use Docker for that. You wouldn't use Docker for game engines. You can use Docker for deploying a website. As you'll see later, um, Docker acts as like, like I said earlier, a slimmed down computer, but you can also expose ports on that Docker container. And then people can visit those ports and you can, theoretically, you can run a game engine. If the game engine can be accessible, like as a website, like over a port, um, right. that's, That'd be a really interesting use case of it, but theoretically, I guess. Um, uh, giving an example of games, Minecraft Bedrock, so if anyone here plays Minecraft, um, there's a paid service that Microsoft and Minecraft offer called Realms. Yep, Realms, Paul, you got it. Um, and they run their turn up, their up and down of servers using Docker. And like they use Kubernetes and they use a whole container orchestration. So if they use those words, I haven't told you yet. Um, but they, for example, they can spin up game servers with Docker. So you might not be able to use a game engine in Docker, but you can create a game server in Docker. Um, I'm pretty sure Halo 5 also does something similar with Azure, because Microsoft owns Azure, Microsoft owns Halo, so they're obviously going to use their own stuff. Um, so we're going to jump right into live coding. Um, cloud streaming, yes, you can use Docker for it. Um, so hopefully this example, so hopefully if we live code something up, that will actually illuminate that for you. So we're gonna go ahead and I have an empty little file called app and I have an empty Docker file here. So, so without me telling anybody, what do you think the first thing I'm gonna write uh, in this Docker file is? If you already know Docker, don't say anything. Um, you might get it wrong, but this will be, this will be interesting. See what people think the first command I'm going to write in this year. I'm not writing the code there. in the Docker files. All my Python code is going to live in here. But what will be the first thing? Import uh, external libraries. Close. You're, you're very close. That would be like the second thing you do. You're very close. <laughs> um, <laughs> so if you, so earlier I had mentioned container registry and I didn't cover what Docker Hub was. So Docker Hub is the official container registry for Docker. Um, a lot of companies have their own container registry. Paul, you got it. It is the operating system. So the first thing we're going to do is import what OS we're going to use, more specifically what container we're going to use as our base. Since we're writing Python code, um, we're going to be using the Python image. So there's this really cool blog, uh, blog post that goes into a really deep technical dive of everything that the Python image for Docker installs and uses. Um, so what this image is gonna contain is all the bare minimums we need to run Python. So I think the command is from Python 3.7, we're gonna run 3.7. I actually gonna double check that real quick. I have a Docker file already made, so I'm cheating to make sure I wrote that right. So. The first thing we're gonna do is import our Python image. So what this is gonna do is it's, when I run this command, um, it's gonna go to Docker Hub. It's gonna find the Python image 3.7. It's gonna download that and we're gonna start from there. So it's gonna go ahead, download that. Um, 
And this next command, copy, we're creating our image. Can anyone tell me what copy does? Without looking it up. Copy operating system information? Not quite. This, that is a good guess. So no, so let's so copy. So if we wanna get our code onto Docker, how are we gonna do that? So we have our code right here. Let's say it just says hello world right now. That's not print statement in Python. So let's just say it says hello. Um, so we have our code and we're creating our image, but how are we gonna get our code onto our image? Create an instance and so if we Copy have, app. huh? Copy app.py. Yes, yep. So we can just use this. So it's copy everything around the Docker file into the Docker image. So one thing I kind of glossed at earlier is, let's see, let's go here. The container, this includes your code plus everything needed to run your code. So we already, we're basically done. So we have everything needed to run our code and we have our code. That's literally Docker. That's at the bare minimum, everything you need is literally just those two commands. And then the way we'll run it once we build it is we'll do Python and then what is it? App.py. And so this is gonna run a terminal command. So we're not done yet. We're gonna include some other stuff so I can co cover some stuff. Let's actually do something more interesting with this code. So maybe we're, we are the AI club, so we might use stuff like NumPy. So let's import NumPy as NP. So we have NumPy, um, but Python 3.7 doesn't have NumPy in it. So if I'm gonna use NumPy in my code, what do I need to do now in my Docker file? Pip install. Yep. So we need to, so one thing cool about Docker is if you're familiar, so this is gonna be a bummer to us Windows users, but if you're a Linux user, you're gonna be at home right here, is you can type the command run, and then you can type in any normal command like you would in Linux. So if you wanted to do ls, which is list everything at your current position, you can run ls. And this is great for debugging. If you are debugging a Docker container, running ls is really good. Um, so you could see what's in the container itself. And we'll show, quickly go over a more complicated document. Hey, quick before. question, Anthony. Yeah. Is it running the, let's say the pip install command, mm -hmm. is that running on the Docker container or is it running on like your operating system? Good question. It's running on the container. So the container okay. runs on top of your operating system. So okay. Docker, is a service, it's a Docker is a lot of things. So it's, it's, it, the name itself does a disservice to the name, uh, but Docker is the Docker engine. And it's also the thing that provides the containers so you can run the containers. Um, gotcha, gotcha. Docker so is not the only container service. Um, Brooke asked a great question. I was gonna ask people right now. She's asking, what's the difference between run and command? Um, so if you have VS Code and you install the Docker extension, it should actually highlight this for you. I think it's because I have, um, I'm running this on Windows Subsystem for Linux that I don't think it's showing me right now. So I'm gonna switch back to. One more question. Yeah, what's the question? How do you do comments in Docker if that's possible? You can, so um, let me actually reopen this. You could do comments just like you can do that comments. Just the hashtag, just like in Python. Oh, okay. Um, Docker files are not allowed to do stuff on the host system, as far as I know. I think there might be like vulnerabilities you can exploit with Docker to do stuff on the host system. But one of the advantages that I haven't discussed yet with Docker is the idea of security benefits. So you, if you're deploying a bunch of Docker files on a server, the containers are isolated to themselves. They can't interact with the operating system. Like if I'm, so think about cloud services like Azure and I mention Azure all the time because I interned at Microsoft over the summer. So I do have a bias. Um, but if let's say a cloud service like Azure, they wanna let anybody in the world run Docker images on them, on their services and their servers. 
Um, there could be like a, mal a bad actor running the Docker image on one of Microsoft's server computing racks. And so one of the benefits of using Docker is that it provides a, la a layer of security so that the operating, the Docker container can't op access stuff in the operating system. There are exploits around that. So cloud security is this whole interesting field. I believe there were exploits that allowed to interact with the host operating system, but that's a great question. Great, great like eye for that. Um, and something we're gonna introduce later also helps isolate the layers between the host operating system and the stuff you're running. So, but yeah, so this is our code. And what's the difference between command and run? Let me get back to that question. I didn't forget, Brooke. Um, if you have VS Code, it'll give you helpful little syntax instructions. So run just executes commands on top of the current image, so the image you're currently working on. Docker does work with Google Cloud. Um, it works with every cloud provider. So Google Cloud actually developed Kubernetes as we'll show. Um, command is the entry point. So this is something I haven't discussed yet, but we always write command at the end of the Docker file. That's good practice. What command essentially does is after it runs all those instructions, so we go to Docker Hub, we get the Python image, we copy everything in our local directory, we install NumPy, we run a Linux shell command, and then we're gonna run app.py. So let's go ahead and actually test it out. So, pull up the terminal. I should have changed directory there earlier. I've actually never run a Docker image that's this simple. So I don't actually know if it will work. I'm gonna discuss what I'm writing um, right now. So this command. So we're gonna cover what Kubernetes is in a second, Aiden. So good question though. Um, let's discuss this command right here. So docker build dash t example image. So what could people tell me what docker build is doing? Ignore everything past docker build. Just tell me what is this? So what's docker build doing? Building the Docker file. Hmm? Docker. It's running the Docker file. Um, but what else do you think? What is it outputting? Do you think? It's not running the Docker file explicitly. It's running the instructions on it. So it's running the app.py. No. It's grabbing the necessary resources. Yes. So what essentially Docker build is doing is it's going to follow all the instructions on your Docker file. And then it's going to output an image. And this image is what you're going to run. So let's go ahead. I think I remembered the command. I might have the command wrong. But so what it's going to do, I already have Python 3.7 installed on my machine. So it's going to download this from Docker Hub. It's going to copy all the code. You see it's running and installing NumPy. And that's the same exact output as you would see in your own terminal. So let's see. Let me go ahead and open up Ubuntu. And I'm going to show you again in a second. So, so it's like having the a.out file when you run something on Eustis. Uh, what was that? I didn't hear that comment. What was that? Oh, um, I was just going to say, like, so it's kind of like have, running the a.out file if you run, ever run a C program. Yeah, time. yeah. It's it's basically outputting what's to the console. So if I run pip3 install numpy, if you're wondering why I'm writing pip3, it's because Ubuntu comes with Python 2 and 3 installed. So it would, I, I already have let me actually do it with Python too. Okay. Oh, whatever. That's a bad example. Um, so if you were to write pip install numpy on your own machine, it will say the same exact thing. So collecting numpy, downloading numpy, and that's because Docker is emulating a virtual machine. Um, specifically, I think this is a Linux flavor called Debian. Um, I think it's what it's copying, which is similar to Ubuntu if you want the exact technical specifics. Um, and run ls. So run ls, all this code is doing, let me actually navigate here on my Linux. If you're wondering where I am, this is a Windows subsystem for Linux. So I'm just going to the same place. So, so people who don't know what ls is, all ls is is just lists what's there. So Dockerfile, app.py, and API folder. So that's all ls is doing and ls inside the Docker image, it's just a bunch of, like, like I said, the dependencies needed to run your code. 
Um, the images are platform agnostic, yes. Very, very good thing, Paul. And that's kind of why Docker is really, why people like Docker so much, is that it's fairly platform agnostic. And you see command.py, and you, see, you don't see any output. So you can ignore what like removing intermediate container was. Don't worry about that. But we see step five, command.py, but it didn't say, hello, Docker. It didn't do anything. It didn't say anything. Um, that's because we're not running the image. We just built the image. So if we want to do change this to Docker run. So we built the image. It's on our computer. It's saved somewhere on like your drive. I don't know exactly where. But if we do Docker run, I think this is the command. Might get it wrong. Um, OK, let's see. OK, I have an error. Let's see. Okay, directories. I change directories? No, that's um that so I can leave this directory and still call the same image command. So okay, never mind. <laughs> yeah, so this is uh, now everything's in the image itself. So don't know why that error is happening. We'll worry, worry about it in a second. Let me just make sure I got that run command right. Uh, yeah, that should be it. I think I got the run command wrong. So can you use Docker to run any programming language? Uh yeah. So one of the things people, there's a really cool video that I'm going to link in the resources and the person talks about like COBOL, like what system is going to support COBOL still, um, but you can use Docker to run COBOL. As long as it's an operating system that you can create a container for, you can um, run Docker with it. Okay, so it's not doing that. So this will be fun. We're live debugging. So I've never had to live code something before, so this will be... Fun. And I'll introduce more Docker communities. So work directory, let's do. Uh, I don't know if it matters, but in your example, you had a, a P flag and you didn't have that when you ran it? Um, the, that's for port. So that's, that's a good uh, okay. eye catching. Never so right. I am going to show what that is in an example API. Um, so that's like the, the what port you're exposing. Docker so files can, are also written, Docker's also written in Go, by the way, if anyone was curious. You can build and run your, your images from any directory? Um, so you have to build it. You, so very good question. Um, I totally forgot to look over. So this little dot right here is mm -hmm. you specify the path to the image. Okay. Because so that's what I was saying. I think, I think you're, file, building and, you're building and running in two different... Into the directory. Okay. Does that matter? No, that, that's perfectly fine. You can you just have oh, to okay. build it and you need to specify the path to the Docker file. Um, gotcha. And since I'm in the same directory as the path, I can just do dot. Um, but you can once you run it, the image lives on your machine and you can run it anywhere on your machine. So, oh, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. So the image lives in a separate directory that Docker maintains. If I I guess we can go to it and find it if we wanted to. But I'm just trying to debug here. Uh, looks like we can. Cool. What I'm going to do actually is I'm just going to be lazy. I'm just going to put it in there. I think it has some, it takes issue. I think that should work. It might complain about that too. But so, so since we use VS Code really quick, um, do you need to do and change anything in the user settings to enable Docker to work with it? Because I know I needed to change it for Python. Um, I think it should work out of the box. If not, there, if whenever you start writing a Docker file, it should tell you, oh, do you want to install um, the Docker extension? So the Docker, there's there's like more configuration you can do, but um, the Docker extension gives you nice syntax highlighting when creating Docker files. So. Let's actually see if that works. Thank you. I don't know if it, that did work. So no such file. Okay, it's complaining. I know why it's complaining. Because Python treats folders and directories really weirdly. So, if it doesn't work, that's okay. Um, I hopefully the API example works. So this is fun debugging live. And if we have to skip it over, it's cool. We could skip it over. I'm going to get rid of that NumPy thing just to make this go quicker. Does anyone have any other questions as we're trying to debug why this won't run? Huh. 
What is uh, Kubernetes? Okay, yeah, well, so Kubernetes is actually next in the slides. So after we're gonna get to that right now. Oh, okay, okay. A few slides. So I'm gonna go ahead and run the other example I had prepared. So let's go ahead, we can go ahead and delete that. So I promise you it works. Although debugging Docker can be a pain in the sides. I, I haven't talked about the cons of Docker yet, uh, but debugging Docker can really be a pain. That's why I mentioned the ls command. Um, back during shell hacks, I spent a good, the T flag, thank you, Paul. Uh, the T flag is the tag name. So it's how you name your Docker files. So I called mine example image. Uh, in this example, we'll call it example API. You give it a tag and it just makes it easier to build it. So it's good practice to always have a tag and to name your Docker image. So don't worry about this code. Uh, we're using FastAPI and we're just installing some stuff. So FastAPI is an API framework for Python. Um, really nice. So if you're competing at Night Hacks this weekend and you want to write an API real quickly, FastAPI is the recommended way to do it. And this is some good starter code that can help, help you with that. So, and also if you're in uh, Poop or Senior Design, so Poop is processes of object-oriented programming. It's no longer called that anymore, but FastAPI is also really good for those classes too. So we're actually using FastAPI in our senior, my senior design project. So let's go ahead. API to, I'm gonna copy the command. And I'm gonna quickly talk about that Docker file because that Docker file is different. So while this is building, this one, you notice we're using the word expose 8,000. So um, kind of earlier, we spoke about Docker's not allowing to do anything with the host system. Docker, it's like the containers themselves have a lot of restrictions. So unless I tell my Docker file to expose that port, I can't access that port. So if, if I like commented that out and I tried to access this port, if I tried to send a request to the API, it'd be like, no port is open. So it adds this extra layer of security for work when working with APIs. So. I pray this works. Um, if you're wondering why these commands are separated like this, uh, this I'm not entirely sure as to the reason. I actually think that's why my other example broke because I wasn't separating things. Um, but we'll I think realize that now in retrospect. But let's hopefully we can get this running. Um, Core's middleware. I forgot to import something. I'm going to delete this and make my life easier instead of looking up what it is. Oh, no, whoops, I gotta rebuild it. So this is a good time. If I edit the code, you need to rebuild it because uh, I made changes to the code and the image doesn't know that. So. Cool, we have it running. So we're running the API. This is running the Docker image right now. If I open up a new tab on my terminal, uh, this is called Windows Terminal, by the way. This is an upgraded terminal experience for Windows developers and it is really amazing. And I type in Docker PS, it tells me uh, there's a container running, the image name is example.api, and it's been up for 19 seconds and was created 20 seconds ago, and what ports it's open on. So see, we just created that image and we just ran it. So I'm gonna head over to Postman, um, and I'm gonna go ahead and just have the port already there. I send it something and it responds with hello world. And if we open up this, we said, oh, we got a request in and it said, okay. So let's go ahead and actually, so it's okay if nobody really understands this code. This is a workshop on Docker, not so necessarily developing APIs. Um, but if anyone has questions about this code after the workshop, I'm more than happy to answer them. Uh, and this will be uploaded codes that you can use and everything. And I'll be a mentor for Night Hacks this weekend. So if you want to use Fast API and if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to help. So we're going to go ahead and send, we're going to hit this search endpoint. So let's open up Postman again. So we can show an example of Docker working. I think I already have. No, I don't. Okay. This might break because I might not have it the way my code wants. But let's copy that. 
could have done more preparation, but we're cowboy coding this. Okay. I'm writing some JSON in here, so it's perfectly okay if none of this makes sense. We're just testing the API. So, so we send, I went ahead and send search and it said 405 method not allowed. So we made an error, but we can still view the output of our server here in the Docker image. So if I were to get this to work, what it would return is we found something. It would return array that says we found something just like earlier we said return hello world. So I actually know, think I know why I got this wrong. Uh, I don't think I have application based on there, but I'm not gonna worry too much about it because again, this is not a workshop on developing APIs and I don't wanna really start confusing people. So let's jump back into the presentation and at the end of the workshop, we can go ahead and go back to the Docker files and how to make them. Um, so back to everything, how does Docker help us with ML? So quite simply, as the slides say, um, NVIDIA cards are great. If you want to do machine learning, you want to use a NVIDIA card. Uh, AMD is just kind of out of the question these days. You can use them for machine learning, um, but NVIDIA kind of has the market there on CUDA and all their drivers. So what the thing with NVIDIA cards is installing drivers is kind of a pain. And I, I do have to tell you that just because you're using a Docker container doesn't mean you can escape installing drivers. But one really nice thing about using Docker with NVIDIA is that you don't have to worry about all the dependencies for your code being installed on your machine and any headaches that can make with installing the drivers and everything. Uh, John is gonna cover this more detail this Saturday at Night Hacks 1 to 3. Uh, it is a long workshop because he's gonna work you through a very long example of using Docker with machine learning. So I'm not gonna talk about it too much here. And I imagine not a lot of people here have had to had the terrible headache it is of installing GPU drivers. But if you had, please comment in the chat how easy it is to break your own machine with installing GPU drivers. I've broken my PC at least twice trying to do it. So it's, it's not the worst. A, it's, it's not a good process. Um, it, so <laughs> Docker can at least help easy that make that process a lot easier. So to finally answer what Kubernetes is, it's not super exciting and we're gonna kind of gloss over it. It has a cool name, uh, but Kubernetes is essentially a service for automating Docker containers and automating and overseeing like the operations of them. So if you are Google or if you are Microsoft or any big tech company and you have hundreds of products and services and APIs, just like we had our API example earlier, you wanna make sure you're using your resources efficiently and Let's say I'm a tech startup and my market is just Florida. So, and my market is for people who work nine to five jobs. So if I have an API that these people working nine to five jobs in Florida use, I don't want to be using my resources at night. And one really awesome thing about Kubernetes is it lets you spin new Docker containers up and down as you need them. It does a lot of other stuff too, but if I'm a startup paying for server usage with a cloud provider, I don't always want to be using paying like a big $100 bill because I have hundreds of containers running 24 seven. Instead, I only want my, con I want 100 containers when traffic is really high. And if traffic is low, then I can switch down the amount of containers I use. Um, some people here might recognize this as load balancing. And that is a separate term, and I'm more than happy to define that later, and that's a whole portion of system design interviews. But Kubernetes helps you load balance and do a lot of other things with Docker. So just like we use code to automate a lot of things, um, and then we use Docker to help automate deployments, you then use Kubernetes to help automate Docker. So it's kind of automation all the way down, per se. And this is a quick introduction to WebAssembly. Um, does anybody know what WebAssembly is before I, I kind of jump into it? I'd be really surprised if, if you're my, one of my friends who was attending the talk, I think you know what WebAssembly is because I've spoken about it with you. So none of you get to talk, but other people, please. It also gives me a water break. Cool, nobody's talking, so I'm guessing nobody knows what WebAssembly is. So this is really funny. Um, WebAssembly, I was like, WASM is short for WebAssembly. Um, it lets you compile like your C++, C, Rust, basically any language, not just low-level language, 
into code that runs in a browser. So web browsers by default only run JavaScript, which is a blessing and a curse. Uh, but WebAssembly lets you run, it's a, it's a bytecode format, like kind of what someone mentioned earlier with Java, Java bytecode, that essentially just lets you run any arbitrary code on the browser. Um, I'm going to be careful with that statement because WebAssembly is really cool for it's the same reason Docker is really cool, um, is that it has these really in interesting security privileges. But Let's, I'm just going to talk about something right here is Solomon Hikes is one of the, basically the creator of Docker. And he's saying in this tweet, uh, if WebAssembly and WASI, which is WebAssembly interface, um, and I'm going to explain what that is in a second, but the slides kind of give it away. Uh, basically, if these technologies existed, Docker would have been pointless. Uh, and why is that? Why would Docker have been pointless if WebAssembly was a thing back then? So what WebAssembly does is it packages code just like how Java packages code in this bytecode format and Java has the same write once, run anywhere, 3 billion devices, stuff like that. What WebAssembly does is it lets you run this code on any browser. So I can write C code and I can run it in Nix web browser. He doesn't even need C installed in his machine. I mean, every C machine has C installed, but let's say he didn't have it installed. He can run it on his browser because it's just an assembly code format and the CPU just needs to decode what that is. So we developed WebAssembly for the browser, and then people are like, WebAssembly is really cool. How about we run it outside the browser? So we're basically, we went from these low-level languages that run on the desktop, we're like, we should use them in the browser, and then we're like, hey, let's them use them back on the desktop again. Um, but WebAssembly and Docker, they both have this idea of like least, what's the word again? It's a very security focused word, uh, principle of least privilege. So how we mentioned earlier with the Docker file that you can only run, like let's say I can't, if I only expose port, port 8000, then the container can use port 8000. The same thing with WebAssembly. Um, I don't know if you guys saw this, but about a year ago, the Discord desktop, desktop client was subject to a malware attack. Um, and things like that happen. Your software can be vulnerable to attacks and vulnerabilities that can let hackers get into your system. The really cool thing about writing an app with WebAssembly is that you specify the exact permissions that that app has on the host file system. And that's why WASI is really cool because if I write Discord in WASI, then maybe I can restrict the security around the, the desktop application and keep users more secure. Uh, and the same thing goes for web. That's a really high level overview of why WebAssembly is cool. You can also use WebAssembly to basically do technically almost anything that Docker can do. Whatever you can write in C++ or Rust, you can put it to WebAssembly. Um, and I'm more than happy to have a WebAssembly talk later, but if Docker is something that interested you and you got more into the community of Docker, I wanted to introduce you to these terms before you saw them anyways, even though there's no direct bearing relation to Docker. So, this was a quick 50 minute overview. We just hit the 50 minute mark. Technically I have five more minutes of Docker. I understand that a lot of these terms might've been confusing. You might leave this on still not understanding what a Docker file is. Um, if that's you, let's talk in the AI Discord afterwards. I wanna make sure if you're gonna use Docker, if you're gonna continue using it, that you at least can run the first Docker file. Um, so if any of this was really interesting to you, you thought, wow, this is really cool. This sounds really cool in the normal programming. Um, you might want to consider learning more about ML ops, so machine learning operations and DevOps. These are the people that basically keep code deployed. They keep it scalable. They basically super important roles in software. So if you liked all that, definitely learn more about those roles. If you liked all this, please check out our workshop this weekend that John's having. It's all about ML ops and it goes into way deeper Docker and ML talk than I did today. So this is actually the previous quit workshop. He wanted me to cover how to write a Docker file. Um, and I, like I said, it was that easy. You just need a few commands. Um, you just need from, you gotta get your copy of your dependencies and then you gotta get the command to run your code. So that's everything. Uh, I know that might not be super satisfying, and I know the examples might be, well, that's it, that's all Docker does, um, but that's kind of why Docker is so popular. It's literally, it's just that. It's, it's no secret behind it. There's no complicated tuning you're doing. It's, it's why Docker has taken, I think, the, the deployment world by storm, per se. Um, so yeah, any questions? 
So is John giving the workshop at Night Jax, right? Yep, at one o'clock, Saturday, one okay. o'clock, John is giving the is, workshop. He is, is that the, in their the Discord? It is, is, we'll be in their Discord, yes. And he should okay. promote it in our Discord too. Okay, yeah, yeah, we'll promote that for you guys. But like you said, this is a great introduction into more AI-oriented applications with Docker. Um, so definitely super useful stuff here. Question. Uh, what is uh, WASM and WASI? And, or I mean, like, what's the difference? And what's well, each one? So WebAssembly is just like an assembly format for running low, like code in a web browser. And WASI is an interface for running WebAssembly outside of the browser. So WASI depends on WebAssembly. So it's like, gotcha. it's just like, so actually I think the best way to compare it is like virtual machine and Docker. So we could think of what uh, the web browser is a virtual machine and WASM runs in that virtual machine. And then WASI is this slim, like you don't need a web browser anymore. It just provides the bare essentials to run WebAssembly. Um, if that makes sense. I don't know if that analogy is Okay, really and then it says uh, C++, Rust and low level. Can you it can also include- language. You can even use Python. Oh, any language, okay. Yeah. Um, people often, so the reason why Rust is mentioned there, not only is it a great language and you should learn it, um, but Rust is really tied into the WebAssembly community. Um, they, the Rust community does a lot of work in advancing WebAssembly. So Mozilla right here does a lot of work with WASI and other companies do too, but Mozilla developed Rust. And so there's a really interlinked relationship. So that's why I gave it a shout out. So, but you can use any language with um, Web, WebAssembly. So if you just like Google WebAssembly, like Python WebAssembly, um, what WebAssembly essentially is, if you've taken uh, CDA, um, you know that all code gets compiled to assembly. WebAssembly is just like a different backend. So you write your C code and rather than it going to like the CPU instruction set, it will go into the WebAssembly instruction set. So there's nothing you need to change about your code. Um, you just need to compile it uh, with a different compiler is all that it is. So it's an easy swap out. Gotcha. Yeah. Is that kind of related to like some of these cross-platform apps like Discord, like um, frameworks like React Native at all? No, that Discord is using Electron. So the Discord, Discord oh, yeah, my bad. is using Electron, which is a whole other mess. Uh, you yeah, can use bad. WebAssembly and Electron together because Electron is a web browser, essentially. <laughs> Um, and if you don't know what Electron is, don't, don't, it's, it's okay. <laughs> uh, it's not too adequate knowledge for any of this. Um, but Electron just lets you run JavaScript as a desktop app. It's a better way to put it. Yep, uh, VS Code also runs Electron. So uh, Electron is essentially a Chrome browser. So whenever you're running VS Code, you are essentially running an uh, instance of Chrome. So it may not seem like it, but this is a Chrome browser basically. Um, any other questions related to the workshop? So cool. Um, I'm going to fix what was wrong with, oh, sorry, someone was going to go. No, that was just me. Yeah, I'm going to fix the, the broken demo we had. I know the examples weren't super exciting, but like I said earlier, there's not a lot of magic to Docker. Um, and just there's just a lot of vocabulary that can make it really uh, intimidating for people. But literally just those two commands and those simple statements I wrote is all you need to do to get Docker up and running. Um, it gets more complicated as you try to do more things with Docker. Um, I spent entire work days at my internship, um, several different internships trying to debug Docker. Uh, there's a lot of cons to it that I didn't really bring up, but I think the pros outweigh the cons, especially for writing re like scalable code and reproducible uh, deployments. So. It's definitely something you should learn and um, as soon as possible because it really makes you stand out, especially for internships. They like seeing Docker on your resume. It's a big buzzword for recruiters and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you kept it really simple because this is going to allow other, like, you know, everyone here to just be able to, like, pull down your code and kind of edit it and not get too lost in the sauce with, like, fancy details. Yeah, I'm gonna, so I'm gonna re-upload the simple example I had earlier. I'm gonna get it working and it'll be up there tonight. So you don't have to use my API example. You can use something a lot smaller. Um, you could technically run your assignments in Docker if you wanted to. I wouldn't recommend doing that, but you can do it.
and there's a lot of other cool Docker things that I didn't mention. Um, but I'll include a whole list of resources if you want to dive deeper into Docker afterwards. So this was a very high-level overview and a very rapid-fire introduction. It's very hard to do Docker in 50 minutes. So thank you.